If you love our crypto content or are looking to learn even more about crypto, be sure to check out and subscribe to our new YouTube channel after this video dedicated to all things crypto. Find new videos every week. Be sure to check the link in the description. Charles, welcome back to Real Vision. It's good to be here, Ash. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. You know, you were last on, I believe, in December of 2017, my first week at Real Vision. Uh, so much has happened uh, between now and then. You uh, are really are one of the founding fathers of the space, uh, co-founder of Ethereum. Uh, and if you could just give us the framework for how you think about this space, starting at the very beginning. You know, there is uh, George Lucas likes to say that uh, history doesn't repeat it rhymes and there's a lot of truth to that so when you look at our industry you know the industry really came from the internet uh, and the internet what the major thing there was that information used to be expensive to move so it took time effort and money to move a book from bob to alice or to tell somebody something then this internet comes around then suddenly emails here we, we have the web browser and magically you can just learn anything instantaneously and the cost of moving information went to nothing so because that became a thing people started saying well what else can we teleport all around the world we have all these siloed systems for example financial systems it's really expensive and time consuming to move money around the world with remittances and wire uh, wire transfers and these types of things so uh, for a long time a lot of people were trying to create some sort of internet native digital currency that could represent value and just be teleported just like email is teleported anywhere and uh, there were attempts as early as the late 1980s the early 1990s and there was pioneers like Hal Finney and Nick Sabo and uh, Wei Dai and uh, people like David Chom, they even created companies in the 90s like DigiCash that were attempting to do this. But nobody had figured out a way to do it without involving some trusted third party, some central company that acts as a settlement and clearinghouse. And that, that's really not desirable in the age of the internet because who is in charge of the internet? There's no one company, no matter how big, like Google or Microsoft, that if you take out the internet, it just stops working. So they said, okay, eventually in 2009, Bitcoin came around and Bitcoin basically proved that you could find a way to teleport value anywhere in the world instantaneously with no counterparty risk. It's like email for money. And then nobody really believed it when it came out. And it took a long time for it to reach a network effect. In the first year, it was so unstable that if one person stopped mining, like the hash rate would fall 50% or something like that. And the tokens had no value. When I came into the cryptocurrency space, we used to trade them on spreadsheets. Bitcoin was under a dollar. It wasn't uncommon for people to say, well, you know, I'll send you 10,000 of these things because I have no idea if they're going to be worth anything or not. In fact, I remember there was a, uh, I think it might have been a, a League of Legends or it was some online game tournament where first prize was $500, second prize was $250, third prize was $100, fourth prize was $50, and then fifth prize was 200 Bitcoin. <laughs> that was like the consolation prize. Thanks for playing. I mean, this is where we were. Then around 2013, uh, Bitcoin got real. Uh, you know, it reached a billion dollars for the first time ever. The Sipurat crisis where a government was just taking money out of people's bank accounts and got people deeply concerned. Entrepreneurs started coming in like Wentz Kasari's and others, and Silicon Valley showed up and legitimate exchanges were created. And that was really the first generation. So we kind of had the proto generation in the 80s and 90s. And then in the 2000s, it was kind of the build up to it. And then the first generation took about four or five years to really percolate. Then at that moment, uh, people started saying, well, hang on a second here. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important. Is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you one dollar. I don't think you can afford to be without it. It was kind of the build up to it. And then the first generation took about four or five years to really percolate. Then at that moment, uh, people started saying, well, hang on a second here. Bitcoin is blind, deaf and dumb. 
it doesn't do much. It, does, it, can't, it doesn't understand the outside world. You can only move Bitcoin. What if I want to issue my own currency? What if I want to program a contractual relationship? Like I'm only going to pay you on Tuesday if you mow my lawn or something like that. Bitcoin didn't do any of that. So we tried desperately to try to add these functionalities into Bitcoin. There were projects like Color Coins, projects like Master Coin. There were some altcoins to explore these things. But really, we needed a moment like when JavaScript came to the web browser. Before that moment, you just had static websites. And then when JavaScript came to the web browser, then you had YouTube and Facebook. And suddenly you had these magical experiences that could be programmed in and interactive with the user. So it wasn't just you broadcasting. There was a notion of interaction. Well, smart contracts coming to the blockchain were exactly that. So with Ethereum in 2013, what we were thinking about is saying, how do we make transactions programmable? And then suddenly you can do peer-to-peer -peer lending. Suddenly you can issue your own assets. Suddenly you can do insurance. Suddenly you can do all these things. So we call that really the dawn of the second generation, the programmability era of cryptocurrencies. And that led to the rise of the ICO. That led to the rise of DeFi. That led to all the things that we now see and take for granted in this right. industry. The problem is that that doesn't work at scale. Uh, so go ahead. I was just going to say, before we go into what's what you're working on now, tell us a little bit about that time period. Obviously, you were one of the co-founders of Ethereum. You were very involved in it. Tell us a little bit about what it was like at the time, the sense of what you could potentially do with it, uh, and how that process unfolded. Yeah, it was. I call it the accidental project. And the reason being is that nobody intended for Ethereum to really exist at the scale that it exists today and had illusions that we were somehow going to be this $200 billion Leviathan that brings in an industry. It was more of a project of frustration. It's no coincidence that the Ethereum founders, all of them had either been building altcoins or building overlay protocols. Uh, and because these things were trying to compensate for things that were missing in, card, in, uh, in Bitcoin. For example, uh, Vitalik was doing work with the Color Coins people. Jeff Wilchie was one of the core developers of MasterCoin. Gavin had been doing open source development for a while in the space. I had created BitShares. And so each and every one of us were looking at different things that we were passionate about, and we couldn't solve those problems with Bitcoin. And so the point of Ethereum was to basically be a proof of concept to show how to build a native smart contracting system that just works at, and it actually, people can build real stuff on it. So, you know, we, we launched it uh, in January of 2014, and we all had these T-shirts made. And on the back of the T-shirt, we actually showed you how to issue your own coin. And it actually had the source code on the back. I still have the T-shirt. I guess they're collector's items now. Uh, and uh, it was such a revolutionary thing because, you know, MasterCoin had raised half a million dollars and spent six months of development work just to accomplish that. And then suddenly you could do the thing with enough code that just it's on the back of a T-shirt to issue a right. token. You know, so we were proving a point. Now, we didn't think for a moment that somehow, some way that this was going to then explode and launch all these industries. The, the, the hope was just to basically encourage the space to understand about programmability and the ne its necessity. From my view, I said, well, there's a lot of things I'm very interested in. I cared a lot about economic inclusion. I care a lot about economic identity. And I said, well, if this technology is going to be any good, it should be the financial operating system for the world. For for and Bill Gates and the far and the shepherd from Senegal has the same access and privilege and rights in the system. We've never had that in human history. Well, to do that, I need protocols to do that. And I can't do that with Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is moving in the right direction. So my thought process was if we built something like this, if it became successful, it will either grow to a point where we can start building that type of stuff and then I can focus on that, or it will encourage the Bitcoin community to upgrade Bitcoin to do this and then I can build on Bitcoin and do it. So I didn't really know which one was going to get there, but I knew that this was another step in the right direction. Now, we were not entrepreneurs. I mean, some people had business experience like Anthony DiOrio and Joe Lubin, uh, but for the most part, we were just guys in our 20s who thought this was a really cool idea. Let's go play around with it and we'll see where it goes. So we did everything wrong, but you know, because it was such a powerful right idea, the project was able to be pushed in the right direction and kind of launch the DeFi and the ICO revolution and the token revolution and create enough imagination to bring millions of new people into the cryptocurrency space, which has now led to a thousand flowers blooming and tons of really cool and interesting projects from government sponsored to deep academic projects to more hacker-esque projects uh, in light of the Ethereum project. Yeah. 
So what were some of the uh, opportunities that you saw uh, or some of the uh, things that you felt needed to be extended beyond Ethereum? So the problem with Ethereum is that it is really truly a proof of concept. And the first person to agree about that is Vitalik because he's building Ethereum too. <laughs> you don't you don't go build the sequel if the original is okay. Uh, and there are really three classes of problems. And I term this the third generation problems. And this is where we're currently at as an industry. Many people are chasing them in their own ways. First, there's scale. And that's a super easy one to understand. So in a distributed system, you'd like a situation that as you add people, the quality of experience and the availability of resources and operating cost stays the same or gets better. You don't want a situation where there's a scarcity phenomena that as you add people, you get less and less for everyone. The easiest way of understanding that is kind of thinking you know, like, uh, imagine a dinner where you, know, you add people around a table, but you have the same amount of food. Everybody gets less on their plate. You'd ideally like a potluck where people come and as they show up, they bring food with them. So there's enough food to feed everybody regardless of the size of the party. And we have protocols like this. For example, BitTorrent is, is one of the greatest examples where the more people downloading a movie on BitTorrent, the faster you get it, as opposed to the slower. And that's opposite of most web systems where the more people using something, if you're at a surge hour, the website gets slower and hard, harder to access. So that's the first property is that we don't have that in the cryptocurrency space. And this is why Ethereum fees are so expensive and why Bitcoin gets clogged and why you can't really do things when you start talking about millions to billions of users. Whether you have a billion users or a million users, the amount of total uh, available resources is the same. So you need to go and change that paradigm and become scalable. So we're all kind of looking for that in our own way. And it's a very difficult problem. Second, there's over 8,000 cryptocurrencies now. Holy hell. And there's tons of legacy financial systems floating around. And so how the heck do all these things talk to each other? You know, imagine Wi-Fi, where your Wi-Fi only works with the manufacturer of your phone. So your Apple phone can only talk to an Apple router. Your Samsung phone can only talk to a Samsung router. It'd be a mess. But we don't have that. We have perhaps the first truly interoperable protocol in all of humanity. You can be in North Korea, South Korea, Iran, Israel, Russia, China, America, uh, and Germany. And despite the fact these countries collectively will never agree on anything common, your phone probably can connect to the hotel Wi-Fi network at all of them. That's a pretty amazing thing if you think about it. So that tells you it's a truly interoperable protocol that is device and country and geopolitically agnostic. So what is the Wi-Fi moment for our industry? How do you move assets? How do you move identity, people, value, information between systems? Uh, and so there's a huge demand for interoperability if these things are truly to be useful, or else what will happen is you'll have 800 fragmented standards and the world won't consolidate. And then finally, you have this meta problem of governance, and I call this the who pays and who decides, or the sustainability problem. So Bitcoin, the reason why it's not competitive uh, is because it can't evolve. You know, Bitcoin is aware, the developers are incredibly smart. They're some of the brightest people in our industry. They're aware of Ethereum. They're aware of Cardano. They're aware of the other 8,000 cryptocurrencies. But even if they want to add smart contract support or side chains or more scalable protocols, it's just, it's chaos. It's damn near impossible to upgrade that protocol and because there's no governance layer. How do you govern a system without rulers? Normally, we think there's a CEO, there's a company, there's Microsoft to Windows, there's Apple to the iPhone, there's Google to Android. Even if these are federated projects like Linux, there's still some ruling class of you know, powerful companies or powerful individuals that stand behind the project. They kind of act as beneficent dictators or the, the, the prophets who shall say what the future needs to be and kind of push people in that direction. With cryptocurrencies, we're saying no one's in charge. There's no leader, there's no CEO, there's no president, there's no powerful company that gets to decide. So the problem is in the absence of that, you have two models. Either you can somehow self-assemble a completely decentralized government and figure out a way to converge to controversial decisions, or you have anarchy and chaos and things slow down as you add people. So just like scalability, as you add people to the system, the system slows down under the current designs. As you add people to the system, their innovation rate slows down. It becomes more and more difficult for us to actually see things come better. The internet is a great example of that. Look how long it's taken to get IPv6 compliance. Look how long it's taken us for to get things that everybody agrees is a universally good idea. Yet it takes 20, 30 years for the internet to upgrade because it doesn't have the right type of governance layer 
So everything grinds to a halt and it's very difficult to do system scale upgrades. Well, these are financial protocols, not just communication protocols. They have identity, they have value, they have all these things. And if you're really going to be competitive with the legacy financial system, you need the ability to upgrade with some predictability. And even if it takes years, it's a process that we know will eventually convert and get done without creating a Bitcoin cash or a Bitcoin SV or an Ethereum classic or you know any of these governance failures that we see inside the system. So that's the third problem is the sustainability problem. And a corollary to that problem is the problem of who pays. A lot of this innovation is horrendously expensive. We as a company pay tens of millions of dollars in engineering and science fees every year just to maintain our people. But then collectively, there are probably $100, $200 million of money that our industry is spending on engineering and R&D budgets just to write and come up with new protocols. And as our industry grows in size and scale, that's going to become billions of dollars. So how does a cryptocurrency pay for its own growth? You need some form of a treasury system for this. You need some sort of financing model that allows it to pay not just today's bills, but bills 20 years from now, bills 30 years from now, or else you'll have the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. So if you add these three things together, sustainability, scalability, and interoperability, uh, I view that as kind of the third generation problem of cryptocurrencies. You keep all the old stuff, you keep the programmability, you, you keep the instantaneously being able to teleport value, you keep the decentralization, you have to do all of that, but now you have to do it at a scale of billions of people. Now you have to do it where it can talk to everything else. And now you have to do it where it has the ability to govern itself and pay for its own bills. And the first person to solve that is probably going to realize the, the vision that Satoshi started with and then the cypherpunks were started with in the 1980s, which is a, truly a global scale financial operating system. So it's a really exciting time because the, the, the rate of innovation is increasing, the rate of investment's increasing, and the competition is very different. When I started, it was just a bunch of guys. We we're having fun. Uh, but we weren't particularly special people. Now my competitors are people like Silvio Macaulay, who's you know one of the world's top professors. He's got the Nobel Prize at Computer Science. He's a Turing Prize winner at MIT. And that's just one of dozens who are at that equivalent level. And that's just eight years. It's incredible to see that we've been able to attract that kind of brilliance and talent into the space. And because of that, I think it's going to get done. And the third generation will be realized the next uh, two to four years. Yeah. And that actually brings us perfectly to Cardano. You know, interestingly enough, Real Vision uh, recently conducted a survey uh, asking on Twitter, uh, what is uh, some of the projects that you'd most like to see on the platform? I think we got about 35,000 responses. Number one, by a massive margin, I think over 20,000 people, I forget the exact number, requested a show about Cardano. So tell us a little bit about the genesis of the project uh, and what you were particularly trying to solve for with relation to scale, interoperability, and governance? Yeah, so first off, we didn't know how to build it when we started it, but we knew the process that would tell us how to build it. And that's exactly the way you should start. You should never be so arrogant to say, I know exactly how to solve all the problems of the world, just listen to my brilliance. We call that a cult leader. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a rational project. You have to evolve and iterate and grow and be humble enough to realize that these are processes. And so the first thing we did is we said, let's just go buy up all the academic talent. So let's go hire a bunch of scientists. Let's set up a lot of research centers at different universities. And let's read everybody's paper, everybody's code, and get a really good sense of how all this stuff works. So we set up a lab at University of Athens and a lab at University of Edinburgh and one at Tokyo Institute of Tech. And we set up a lab at University of Wyoming. We hired more than 25 PhDs. And we ended up writing almost 100 papers, 95 academic papers, like probably 10,000 citations in the portfolio now. And a lot of them went through peer review at computer science conferences, which is the gold standard of um, the computer science field, uh, like crypto and CCS and Eurocrypt. Uh, and basically what these papers did is they fixed a lot of broken windows and they kind of mapped out the science of our entire space and what you can and can't do. So for example, there are global scale protocols. Google runs them, Facebook runs them, Amazon runs them because they have billions of users. And so they need something. But the problem is they're centralized or federated and they assume that a company owns the hardware. So how the heck do you go from that kind of stuff to something where no one's in control and it's Byzantine tolerant, meaning that dishonest actors can show up and try to break things, but they can't break it. So we had to figure out a better engine. Proof of work, for example, it's like the steam engine in the Industrial Revolution. It, it proved that mechanical work is better than human labor. 
But if we had stayed on the steam engine, we cut all the trees in Europe down and it would be an ecological catastrophe and eventually it's, uh, it's self-destructive. So we had to invent a better engine to run a system like this. And so people are saying, well, proof of stake is the way to go. We said, okay, well, uh, how do we know it works? How do we know it's secure? We didn't. So in 2015, we started a research agenda and it took six years and lots of papers and lots of hard work to basically figure out, yes, it does work and here's how to do it. And here's how to do it at scale. And we did this in every category from the ledger rules, the way the network was designed, how programming languages work and so forth. And we brought in usually the top guy in the world or the top person in the world. And we built out a, a beautiful framework of science, but science is not a product. So in 2017, we had a sea change in the project where we said, okay, it's fun being researchers and writing papers. I love reading them. I love writing them. It's, uh, it's a good thing, but we actually need to write code. We actually need to build a product, release it into the world and build an ecosystem and community. So then we asked, well, how do we do that? So we, we had to find like a programming language and a programming paradigm that would give us the ability to follow the science, but also be a real product that people can use and it's useful and it's performant and so forth. So we found a great programming language. It was called Haskell. And we followed a, a mechanism called uh, formal methods. And we pulled all that together. And there was a bit of rough edges there because Haskell wasn't quite ready for an industrial product of this scale. So we actually had to improve the programming language itself. And we set up the Haskell Foundation with others. We made a lot of contributions for cross-platform uh, compatibility, like how to get it to work on Windows and you know, path to getting on mobile devices and so forth, getting it into the browser. It was an enormous engineering effort. It was like a Manhattan Project worth of engineering because we had to implement all this difficult science. We had to do new crypto. But then we had to also make the tools better because the tools weren't ready for prime time for what we were trying to do. And we had to launch a product at the market, compete and, and so forth. So there were a lot of really hard years. I gained a lot of weight, got some white hair, some hair fell out of my head. Uh, you know, that's always what happens when you're an entrepreneur and right? constant stress. I also travel a lot. I traveled to 52 countries in three years and uh, 200 to 250 days a year managing the business side, the community side, the engineering side, and the science side all concurrently. But we got it done. We launched uh, Cardano in September of 2017. We went through a series of massive upgrades last year, and we're doing now a series of massive upgrades this year. And we've built a community almost a million people strong. Uh, our, all of our social metrics are super strong. They keep growing every day. And there's a lot of use and utility that's coming down the pipe. At the same time, I kept saying, guys, the whole reason I'm building this is I want to global financial operating system. And I want this to be in Africa. So it's not good enough to, if we get like a Fortune 500 deal in New Jersey or something. No, this has to work in Ethiopia, which was another layer of problems because we're like, well, how do we do business in Africa? I, I'm, I'm from Hawaii. <laughs> That's about as far as you can get from Addis Ababa. Uh, so uh, we built an office in Ethiopia. We actually went and had people live in the country and train developers there. And we started business development actually all the way back in 2017. And we spent four years just building and learning. We uh, started building people in Mongolia, in the country of Georgia, and a lot of jurisdictions. Um, and it was tremendously humbling. We learned a huge amount. And now we're starting to set up all these beautiful public-private partnerships where we're working with the government, bringing millions of people uh, through these deals into cryptocurrency. And what's great is we'll give them identities, we'll give them settlement systems, payment systems, eventually voting systems, property registration systems. So we're living the dream. And there's a bit of an inevitability behind what we're doing because there's such a strong appetite for these things. And the way we constructed Cardano as an underlying protocol, we have it all. We have a way to fund it indefinitely because of the treasury components of it. We have a decentralized brain because we embedded it within the universities. So there's all these new graduate students and postdocs that are always coming and they're always able to keep innovating. We have the right programming model that it's built on granite. So you know there's no bugs or security flaws or existential protocol things that are gonna blow up in your face and kill you. And we have the right marketplaces where there's a lot of young, very passionate people that want change. Like Ethiopia, 70% of the countries at or under the age of 30, most are digital. Most have cell phones. Most are online. Most are taking Coursera classes and edX classes. They bridge that gap. And they say, why doesn't my country have a better system than America? And we come and say, well, you can build it. Here's this platform to do that. So it's just, uh, it just, it took six years to do it. And it was a hell of a lot of work, but uh, we're now just starting to see it wake up and it's just incredibly humbling. 
Charles, it's an incredible story, and I imagine that a lot of people who are relatively new to the crypto space uh, are inspired by it. They're impressed by the process that you've gone through, the way that you've logic through it, uh, and the number of really smart people who are participating in it. But I can see the question rising in their mind, but what does it actually do? Right. So I think there are a lot of people out there right now uh, who have just started to get their head around what Bitcoin is and potentially around what Ethereum is. They understand uh, it's a digital uh, store of value, kind of uh, a metaphor for gold. They understand smart contracts or the ability to execute code on a blockchain. What is it exactly that Cardano does for people who are not uh, eyeball deep in the digital asset space? Yeah, so basically it's just a collection of protocols and technology that allows you to transform, store, and manage value, identity, and governance. So if you have an instrument of value, that could be a stock, a bond, a commodity, a token, an NFT, like a Pokemon card. It doesn't really matter. You, you need some place to store it, transmit it. You need some place to build contractual relationships around it. Like I'll give you my Pokemon cards if you uh, mow my lawn, that type of a deal. Okay, Identity is who are you? Normally, we take that for granted. Oh, I have a passport, I have a driver's license, but you have credit score. Is it a fair credit score? Maybe, maybe not. Um, for some bizarre reason, my secretary has a higher credit score than I do, and I'm a billionaire. So I'm just trying to figure that one out. <laughs> uh, but it's, so there's, there's something about that system that doesn't seem intrinsically right, but okay. Um, and so there's a lot of these things that don't make a lot of sense in how identity is brokered and handled in our world, but in the developing world, it's non-existent in many places. There's tons of people there that are brilliant, that are honest, that are very hardworking, and they are completely shut off from the global economy because there's no way to assess whether that counterparty is rep reputable, trustworthy. Like, for example, microfinance. Uh, let's say some guy runs a farm and says, I want $200, $300 uh, for uh, you know a loan for fertilizer. And if I do this, I can upgrade my farm, get much better yields, and I'll make windfall money, and I'll be able to pay that back. He said, great, 85% interest. He said, oh, God, that's, that's usurious. He said, well, how do I trust the counterparty? How do I know you're actually going to pay me back? The default rate may be high, may be low. There's no credit systems in a lot of these places. Yeah. So identity is a huge problem, and that's why 3 billion people are under or unbanked in the entire world. And that's why remittances are 15%. That's why microfinance is so expensive. That's why we don't have good insurance markets in these places to protect people on the downside. So we need an engine for identity. And then finally for governance, how do you govern things? Like for example, these transnational trade agreements. Uh, look at, I was just at a meeting with a major telco and we were talking, complaining about Verizon and Sprint and T-Mobile. Uh, and these agreements for roaming and these agreements for brokering data capacity amongst the networks. And it's just very ossified. So what happens when those telcos want to meet with Mobicom in Mongolia? What happens when those telcoms want to go meet with uh, people in the UK or across the world? How do they broker transnational agreements? Is there just going to be one universal government to decide how telecommunication should work? Is the ITU going to somehow be in charge of every teleco in the world? No. You have to broker trust relationships between these entities to be able to move subscribers and data and other such things between networks. Because we travel. If I land in Heathrow, I'd like when I turn my phone on for my phone to work. And it shouldn't take 500 lawyers and billions of dollars to make such an arrangement work. It should be seamless from one system to another system. And that's where there's Fortune 500. What about medical records? You know, I've been 52 countries in the last few years, and I was thinking, gosh, what if I got in a car accident in Tanzania and I'm unconscious? And there's a Tanzanian doctor calls my doctor in, in Colorado and says, hey, uh, Charles is unconscious, but I need all of his medical records because I'm trying to treat him. No, trust me, I'm, I'm real and legit. Uh, he can't talk to you, though, because he's unconscious. How does he get my medical records to treat me? I could be un uh, gone for days. And there might be vital information there. So there's just a simple problem brokering the movement of medical records from one country to another country. And that's the point of these protocols is that there's a million of these problems, whether it be the adulteration of drugs, uh, you know, like Mongolia, a third of all the medicine in that country is in some way bad, it could be expired or mislabeled or counterfeit. So if you're trying to take an antibiotic, you have one, three chance of getting a bad pill. That's a problem. And the point of our industry, this technology, is to say it's a Swiss army knife of protocols where you can build applications on top of it that handle that brokering of value, identity, and governance so that you can solve real problems.
and you could solve them in a way where everybody participating in them, they all know the rules up front. Okay, they don't have a situation where one party knows more than another party. There's no information asymmetry. They don't have a situation where there's a gatekeeper who can shut you out, even in the social media side of things, the deplatforming. The reason that happens is the social networks are the boat and the river. They are the ones who get you into the flow of information, but they also own the river. So they get to decide which boats get to sail there. So if you're on Twitter and you get deplatformed, you lose access to the entire Twitter network. And you're no longer a member of that massive community. The same for Facebook or so forth. And it's even worse that the places where they're not the river, they cooperate with each other. And they'll say, well, if somebody competes with us and we don't like their values, we're going to get to platform them so they have no marketplace. That's because the protocols are the companies together. And wherever you fall politically on that, maybe you're a winner in that, maybe you're a loser in that, but it's a real bad idea in society for only a small group of companies to have so much control over so many people and be unelected and unaccountable to the democratic process. And so the point of this protocol approach is saying, let's reimagine these things where we separate the boats from the river. Let's reimagine these things where we start with the trust relationships and say, what are the rules for everybody? And then how do we broker the flow of information and value? And how do we govern that in a way that's equally fair to everyone and then you could build solutions on top of it. And then suddenly you have medicine that's not adulterated. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you can have freedom of speech that's important to you. Suddenly you can now have a situation where you can get a loan that doesn't cost 85% interest. Suddenly you can get remittances where you can instantly move money to your family back in Mexico City or in Cebu. And it doesn't cost you $15 to move $100. It costs you five pennies or something like that. The other thing is the liquefaction of value. That's a huge component in our industry. There's so much in life that's illiquid. Let's say you collect art. It's very valuable art. What is your exit strategy for that? You have to sell it. You know, what's your marketplace for a hundred million dollar, you know, Da Vinci? It's not very good, and it takes quite a bit of time. Or real estate. Like, what if you have this incredible real estate portfolio? How long would it take you to liquidate three billion dollars of real estate or something? That's a very time-consuming, stressful problem. What if you could fractionalize that? Yeah. Sell a quarter of a racehorse, quarter of a painting or something. That you can liquidate that much more easily. What about intangibles? Like a pharmaceutical company, its primary value is usually its intellectual property portfolio. What if you're an up-and-coming pharmaceutical company that has this incredible IP portfolio, but no market yet? Because it's still going to take five, 10 years to get approvals and develop it out. Like Novavax or like Moderna or these other companies. They got very lucky with the pandemic, it gave them an injection of capital, but they had yet to deliver products to market. Novavax case, 30 years. However, now that they're rolling, they're probably going to have a $10 billion revenue line every year. Well, what if you could tokenize the IP portfolio for future returns and go and sell that on a market? And that's just a magical thing and to be able to get liquidity at the small scale all the way up to the global scale and have universal markets for this. And here's where it gets really cool. And this is kind of the capstone of all of it. When you go to Starbucks or McDonald's or these places, usually you pay in dollars or euros and they get paid in dollars or euros. But what if we could move to a world of a universal wallet where your wealth is no longer represented in a sovereign currency? It's whatever the heck you want and it's as diversified as you want. You can have airline miles and silver and gold and stocks and bonds and real estate and your labor. You could pre-sell your hours, all of these things into a giant wallet. Okay, along with maybe dollars or whatever. And when you go to Starbucks and you buy, you pick whatever you want. Maybe you're going to sell three, 0.0003% of your house as a, as a token. And they get paid in whatever they want. So maybe Starbucks th that year says, you know, let's, uh, we want to take a position in silver. So for 30% of our transactions, we'll be paid in silver. So you pay in your house, they get paid in silver. And there's these decentralized rails that figure out how to sort all that out transform all that value, do it at a very efficient price and settle instantly with no counterparty risk. Everybody gets paid in what they want, where they want. So you move from wealth as I'm this many dollars to wealth as you know whatever portfolio you want. That is the primary utility of this entire thing is to create a system where we can emerge up to that. Everyone has access to it. Everyone's a participant. Billions of people are all collectively in the same things. And it's fraud-free, corruption-free. No government can step in and shut somebody out. You all have access to the same river. Yeah. 
I can hear our viewers' minds being blown by what you've just described. You're talking about effectively a revolution uh, that is every bit uh, as powerful and as large, if not more so, than the revolution that came with the internet, as the internet did for information. You're talking about value, storage, and transfer, and the programmatic ability to structure that type of activity on a universal computer. Exactly. And it is as accessible to the poorest amongst us as it is to the richest amongst us. It's an easy thing to do to build something magical and wonderful for the rich, powerful people. That's what they expect and they have the resources for it. It's a much harder thing to do to build something just that revolutionary, but give it to the person who makes a dollar a day. And this is what our industry is basically doing. Yeah. And, you know, the ability to change people's lives. I was impressed when I rewatched your interview from 2017 talking uh, about things that are happening uh, in emerging markets in the developing world. You know, if you think about um, that, what, what this is doing, obviously great utility here uh, in developed markets. Uh, but if you think about something just as simple as remittances, when you look at a fee of 15 percent uh, to send money uh, back home for people, that effectively means uh, that there are there are people who are laboring, doing the hardest labor imaginable things that uh, most people in the developed world couldn't dream of. And they're paying a bank with basically a month of their labor per year. It's pretty right. extraordinary and really kind of depressing. Absolutely. And that that's the whole reason I joined this space. You know, people often ask me, like, well, why did you become an entrepreneur in this space? I said, well, there were three events that happened in my life that inspired me and pissed me off enough to be so crazy that I, I get to wear a poncho and run around and do you know stuff around the world in Africa and other places. I said, well, first off, I, I used to live in Virginia. And when I was there, I, I'd go to the same diner over and over again. And uh, the waitress who served me one day, I'd never forget this, her husband came in, they started talking in Spanish to each other and she was in tears. And I asked her what happened and she said, well, her husband, who's an undocumented immigrant, uh, he was a drywaller. He had just been paid. He was pulled over by the police. They found the cash in his car and they confiscated it. They didn't arrest him. They didn't charge him with anything. They just confiscated it, said it was drug money. And that was called civil asset forfeiture. And he has no recourse. He can't really sue. He can't really do anything. You know, he's not even in the U.S. legally. So basically, with theft in the United States, in Virginia, and I, I just couldn't believe in my country that that would happen. You hear that, you say, oh, that's, uh, that's Zimbabwe, that's Syria, you know, that's Iraq, that the, the corrupt countries do that. We don't do that in the United States, that a police officer just take money from a person who is obviously at the bottom of the economic pyramid, and they do it because they know they can get away with it. You know, second, I remember in 2008 when the financial crisis happened and Obama got elected. And I was very excited about it. I was a Ron Paul guy, but I said, well, this Obama guy is completely new. He has his little, his middle name is Hussein, for God's sakes. This is as far out in the political say, system you can go. We don't do this in America. He has a super majority. You know, he has all 60 senators. He's got the whole Congress. The U.S. population wants blood. Wall Street's going to pay. The banking system's going to be reformed. Regulation's going to come to fundamentally transform our relationship with our financial institutions and systems. This guy comes in, no one went to jail. There were emails from Goldman Sachs traders and other people laughing how they screwed people selling them junk. And there was congressional hearings where they read out the emails and no one went to jail. Everybody kept their bonuses. It, there was no change. And the system got bigger. The banks that were too big to fail consolidated and got even more bigger. It's crazy. It just blew my mind that this was allowed to happen. And it made me so cynical. And then the last thing was I read this biography about Norman Borlaug. And he's one of those guys that nobody remembers that name, but he actually had one of the greatest impacts in human history. So he was just this unassuming agricultural technology guy who really loved fertilizer. And he went around the world teaching people how to use it properly. And they estimate that over his lifetime, because of the agricultural practices that he taught people, over a billion people's lives were saved. A billion people didn't starve to death. One person saved one billion people. So when I, those three formative events, it said, okay, the world's not gonna change itself. You can't wait for a savior. Uh, it said that there is certainly a lot of injustice at the small scale and at the global scale, even in my own country, and one person can change the world. So when those three things happen, I said, you know what, let me go do something crazy and do this whole cryptocurrency thing. And so I joined the space and I was trying to figure out what to do. I started with education and kind of pushed through. And 
now we have millions of people that are drinking the Kool-Aid. And you know what you call millions of people? That's an army. And over time, that'll grow to billions and eventually it will change the entire of the world. I feel an inevitability behind this industry because it has the right mindset, it has the right technology, and it's ethical. How can you argue with creating a financial system that's fair for everyone? How can you argue against getting rid of corruption? How can you argue that when you vote, you know your vote was counted properly, especially for places you know, in the Middle East or other places where there's huge amounts of election fraud? How can you argue that everybody is held to the same standards and the same set of rules, regardless of what family they were born into or if they're wealthy or if they're poor or so forth? And how can you argue for a system where you get to keep the fruits of your labors? You own your own identity. You own your own money. And uh, you know it's consent-based instead of just trust us, we'll, we'll take good care of you. And so given that we have an ethical and philosophical advantage over the incumbent system, alongside a massive order of magnitude improvement in efficiency and uh, get rid of all this fragmentation, it just makes sense to me. It's like comparing the vacuum tube to the transistor. You know, you look at the science and you look at where it's going and you say, it's just like Don Valentine when he started Sequoia. It's like, guys, this is going to eat everything. I got to get on this train. I don't know how, but I got to get on it because in 10, 20, 30 years, when you project it out, that vector is is going to be running with the horses. It's uh, It's gone. Uh, and so I, I think we're definitely right place. And I have hope there's just too much money. Bitcoin hitting a trillion dollars, it's too big to fail. Now we are at the size that Chase was at when it got a bailout. Yeah, you know, There's no way that they can say, okay, we're going to bail those guys out, but not us. The institutions are getting aboard. Tesla just bought some. You know, The other Fortune 500 will follow. Uh, it, the ship has sailed and this industry is here to stay. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting things is I, I hear you discuss this at a, at a broad philosophical level. Uh, we have, we're in this incredibly politically polarized time right now, obviously. But I imagine people who are on the libertarian side uh, and on the progressive social justice uh, side of the equation are probably both nodding their heads, listening to some of the points that you're making about keeping the fruit of your labor uh, mo a more fair, uh, balanced, uh, and open system. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's kind of funny. They say, well, the, the system is systemically flawed, so we need to change the system. It's just bizarre to me that a lot of people come out and say, well, the solution is to make a bigger and more powerful system. It's like, no, <laughs> just because you think you might be in charge of that system for a while doesn't necessarily translate to you actually getting what you want. Almost always you lose control of the Leviathan and then people co-opt it who actually have opposite values as you. And now they're in a much better position to massively hurt you. You don't solve a bad system by building a bigger system. You solve it by fundamentally changing the relationship and the nature of the system. We did this. Americans are the original revolutionaries. You know, we had this great revolutionary war, and and at the end of it, the Europeans were absolutely convinced that George Washington was going to become king of America. In fact, they were trying to figure out, like, why doesn't he have children? Is he sterile or is it his wife? And they were betting maybe if his wife was, who can we marry him to so that he can build a dynasty, right? So they were like, well, you know, which country is going to be first? Or certainly France. And then when will the British crown recognize the American crown and so forth? This was correspondences. They actually still have them in European museums between different people throughout Europe. And then we say, hey, yeah, Washington's resigned his commission. He's given up the army. And uh He's just, uh, well, they're going to do this democracy thing, this constitutional republic. And they're like, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, it's yeah, clever, but no, what's the, what's the rob? What's the trick? It just <laughs> blew their minds that we would be so crazy to you know, be like Cincinnatus and hand all this power back and put people in charge. It's, it's, and it's madness. And surely thereafter, there's a French Revolution, and all the kings are like, whoa, this thing is starting to catch on. We're a little scared of it. Uh, so we were the original revolutionaries in that respect, and we didn't always honor the things we put on paper, but that mindset is inculcated and ingrained into our culture. And I like to believe that if you don't like the system you have, then you should just go change it and don't ask for permission, find a way to make it happen. And if you have values, try to find a way to grind your values into the system that you're creating and make them immutable. The power of blockchain is that you can do that with code. For example, Satoshi said 21 million Bitcoin. That's not a debate. It's there. It's built into the system. Whether you agree with it or not, that, that's the term of use going into that. It's, it's cut into stone. You might as well tattoo it on your body. It's not going to change. Okay. And you, you can now, because of programmability, you can build social structures 
and tr settlement systems, lending systems, whatever you want with that same level of immutability of value. And I think that's the core proposition of our space, not beyond the incentives engineering we do and the liquefaction of value and so forth. The fact that our philosophy, our principles, even if they're inconvenient to the moment, can be enshrined in a way that they're immutable. Bitcoin was tested. For example, in 2013, when Mt. Gox collapsed, the Bitcoin core developers had millions of dollars of their own money on Mt. Gox. And there was uh, people walking around saying, well, should we like fork Bitcoin to reimburse the people who lost money? Because it's such a catastrophic event. The core developers didn't even consider it. They said, no way, no how. We're not going to think about it. It is what it is. We lost our money this time. But for the integrity of the system, the system has to preserve and run as it was written. Code is law in this respect. That's a new thing in humanity. We're very good at making rules and then having exceptions to the rule. No hats. Ah, I guess you can wear a hat. No masks. Okay, I guess you have to wear a mask. You know, we're always good at finding that one little edge case and saying, no, no, no. But the laws of physics don't have exceptions. There's been more than one mountaineer climbing a mountain who suddenly wishes that gravity didn't apply to him. Uh, so, you know, no matter how much he has that wistful thinking, he's just going to have to deal with the consequences of gravity. And similarly, it's nice to have social institutions and, and structures where you have that same level of certainty and assurance. And if you can encode them with good principles, they'll endure generation after generation, uh, and then we can build a proper society on them that's fair for everyone. Yeah. It's a powerful and very large vision, uh, which brings me to this question. In terms of pragmatically, where are we right now with Cardano in the process of realizing that vision? What's great is there's a lot of competitors. There's Algorand and Tezos and there's F2 and so forth. And all of us are kind of scratching at the same things. And, and that's great because these are strength in numbers and they have different philosophies and teams and scientific approaches. And so somebody's going to get it done. Cardano, I think, is the leader right now in terms of because we, we did the deep investments in science and we did the deep investments in proper engineering. And we have market access to the places where I think this is going to shine the brightest as I said, I'm not here to make the 17-year-old yield farmer in his mom's basement in New Jersey rich. I mean, he'll figure it out for himself. He's okay. Uh, I'm worried about the farmer in Ethiopia. But, you know, regardless of where you fall in the spectrum, there's enough people here that we're starting to see very real progress on scalability, sustainability, and interoperability. There's protocols like NEPA POWs and a lot of cool sidechain protocols that exist to move value and information between systems. The Oracle systems like Chainlink and so forth have really evolved and they've gotten to a point where they're starting to become great protocols and the next generation of them are going to be phenomenal. We're starting to see tons of very scalable engines to replace that steam engine of proof of work be proposed that are academically reviewed and tested at scale. And so that's just, there's an inevitability behind that. The hard part is governance and that's a huge experiment. Well, I think we're the leader in that because we have something called Catalyst and we have over 10,000 people actively participating, voting, debating. And before the end of the year, I wouldn't be surprised to see that grow to 100,000 people and it's going to be funding tens, eventually hundreds of millions of dollars worth of projects. And that eventually used for governance, where it actually will decide how to upgrade the system. And we've built that with great universities like University of Lancaster. We've built that with European Union grants like the Horizons 2020 program with IBM Research and Guard Time. So we have a lot of great partners there. And you know, people like Ideascale, they work with us. The CEO of that group, I think, is going to be running a Cardano stake pool. Uh, but that's just the beginning. And that's probably the hardest of all the problems because we don't really have a, a model. You know, it's one thing to say, is there something that runs with billions of people? Sure, Google, great. Okay. Or Windows. All right. So we have that. Interoperability. We have Wi Fi. It works, right? So we have this concept of something that's universal. But is there a perfect government? Is there like one country on the map you can point to and say, everything there works? It's utopia land. No, humans are humans. There's no one of anything. You know, how many languages do we have? I, I had an employee who spoke Aramaic. I was like, I was like, wow, I didn't even know that language is I, I have these. I have these clay tablets from Babylon. I mean, it's like he probably can read them. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's it's a crazy thing uh, to uh, to to have that kind of concept. Uh, so uh, it, governance is the hardest of all of it, and I think that's going to take decades of my career to get there. But we have a process to gradually move in the right direction, and there's going to be a lot of setbacks and failures and so forth. But real use and utility 
that's going to be happening at scale, I think, in three to five years, where millions of people are going to earn their living working in this industry, and it's sustainable. Millions of people will be getting loans from this industry on a regular basis. Millions of people getting their insurance policy from this. Billions, if not trillions of dollars will be moved in remittances every year through this system on its rails at a super low cost. That's three to five years, I think. That's inevitable. And also, you're going to see institutional competition. Only a third of central banks are BIS members. Uh, and two-thirds are not, and they get screwed by the one-thirds who are. So there's all these CBDC, central bank issued digital currencies. We think of the Bank of China, we think of the Federal Reserve, but Angola and Zimbabwe and all these other guys who say, hey, how about we get some fairness finally? So yeah. if they don't get it from BIS, they're going to create their own rails, and they're going to be using our technology to create those types of rails. So uh, three to five years, all that's coming, and that'll lead to the next wave, the next wave, and within 20 years, I think it's inevitable. Yeah. Charles, we could talk for probably six hours here, uh, but I know you have a hard stop in a few minutes. For people who've listened to this discussion and maybe are hearing it at this level of detail for the first time and have just had their minds opened up, what final thoughts would you like to leave them with? There's plenty of time. You know, with every technological revolution, you have all these prophets who come and say, now is the time and you must invest now, you must participate now. And if you missed it, you'll miss the future. I mean, you can build a multi-billion dollar cell phone app today. You can build a multi-billion dollar internet business today. You can build a hardware company and make computers and build a multi-billion dollar. We've been doing that since the 50s. Okay, so there's plenty of time. What you need to do is go at your own pace and you have to pick a problem that you're insanely passionate about. I have people that come to me and say, how do I learn how to program? I say, the best way to learn how to program is find something you want to solve and go write code until you've solved it. For example, maybe you want to write a web scraper uh, maybe you want to automate something. Maybe you want to write a mod for Minecraft. So you have like spells in Minecraft. Whatever the hell your itch is, go figure that out. And then you'll learn code as you go. And you have a goal that you're working towards. So in the cryptocurrency space, blockchain space, we have problems. It could be maybe I want to build Uber for food and uh, in my little town in Tanzania. And I wanted to be able to allow farmers to directly sell fruits and vegetables to the restaurants and create some service for that. Okay, there you go. Build it on our infrastructure. and We'll give you batteries included, a lot of stuff. And if it takes you five years to do it, it takes you five years to do it. It's probably still viable. It's probably still underserved. It, whatever your itch is, do that. There's plenty of time and all the information is free or near free. The chairman of the Securities Exchange Commission used to teach at MIT, a Gensler, and he's, he's got these beautiful lectures up on YouTube from his time at MIT teaching about cryptocurrencies and digital currencies. Like 23, they're free. The Princeton University created a beautiful class on Coursera and a free textbook on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. It's free. So take the time. There's tons of books. There's tons of materials. And, and if it takes you five years, it takes you five years. If this tech is real, it's here to stay. And what is meaningful to you is your problem, your social problem, your community problem. And if you really want to solve that, we are now giving you better tools to solve that problem. And if, if you think that's inconceivable, imagine yourself in 1995, you're at a cocktail party and someone comes up to you and says, I have a business idea. I said, what is it? I want to create a service where you carry this computer with you that somehow is connected to this global network. And you can push a button and a stranger will show up and you could just ride with that stranger and he'll take you anywhere you wanna go. And they'd be like, you're mad. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. And now, now it's like, it's obvious, it's Uber, right? You can just use this phone. It used to be don't talk to strangers over the internet. Now it's like, use the internet to have a stranger show up, get in his car and drive at two o'clock in the morning while you're drunk somewhere. And that we just accept that that's a normal thing. So technology enables insanity. It enables things that were inconceivable to us. And the point of our technology is infrastructural. It's enabling the entrepreneurs of the future to realize dreams that were previously impossible. Yeah. Very well said. Charles, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Ash, this was so much fun. Cheers. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.